Hmm. Hello. First thing, I want to send my love to you today, whenever you're watching this video. Mm. The Beatles song, All We Need Is Love, is, uh, is quite true. I learned, um, I just got back a couple days ago from New Mexico. Um, for a meditation retreat and I learned during an inquiry with somebody what earworms were and if you don't know uh, I, I thought <laughs> it was quite funny actually but I thought that it was um, um, like having a worm in your ear literally because I think quite literal about things um, and I'd never heard the term before but apparently earworms is having a song, a song stuck in your head. Um, so yeah, that was a really funny, funny moment that happened uh, with me and, and uh, someone on retreat. Uh, and you know who you are if you're watching. Um, yeah, all we need is love is coming to mind right now. Um, and I think that leads me into what I want to share and what I want to kind of try to explain and give some context to, um, which is this It's like the, the awakening, the truth, is within that which we don't want to go to. Um, it's not really want, though. It's, it's more like it's in the places that we've been taught habitually that are so ingrained into our approach to the moment-to-moment -moment experience um, unconsciously, unconsciously driven into our body language, into our verbal language, our internal language. Um, the conditioning is so interwoven into those aspects of the experience that say no to certain things, like certain things that are happening mean something about me and um, we don't want to go there, right? But we don't even know necessarily. It's just unconscious. Um, or we think they're the parts of us that need to be healed or need to be fixed. But really, I keep finding in my own experience and in my work with you guys, with each other, with people, that these are the places that... Um, hold the most sacred fruit. Um, that the most sacred aliveness, the, ma the most sacred love, and is also the places that are most deserving of the sacred love and the sacred aliveness. Um, So perhaps a little bit of talking about presence or mindfulness is useful here because there's something about the ability 
to be in the direct experience in a way that is um, open, curious, um, and I think it takes a bit of time to get to that place where there's not resistance happening in your experience as much. There could be some resistance, certainly, but um, get to a place where the resistance has settled um, or even get to a moment where the resistance has settled. Um, that may be through a mindfulness practice, through a breath practice, like breathing uh, or somatic inquiry or um, moving the body or just... Um, whatever it is that helps sort of downregulate the nervous system, um, surrender some resistance to the experience that can allow the openness and curiosity of true nature to, to even be here, to even be possible in the, in the direct experience. Um, because if there's a lot of resistance in the field, then there's a lot of pushing and pulling happening and not seeing clearly, ultimately, you know, um, the identity is another aspect of it, which is like such a limiting factor that prevents clear seeing. Um, and so what this leads me to in this conversation, in this context, is is this idea that we often get, like it, maybe it sounds like I'm saying we need to get rid of resistance. But more so, uh, I'm not saying we need to get rid of anything, actually. So if resistance is what's here, or whatever is what's here, right? It's, it's approaching this moment um, and whatever's arising and just becoming curious and following the thread of what's here, what's coming up. I have this sometimes where I'm sharing and um, working with somebody one-on-one -on -one and I'm, I understand why this is kind of hard to hear or hard to understand, hard to like, it feels counterintuitive because that rooted conditioning that says, don't do it that way, like do it this certain way and this things mean something about you. Um, the rooted conditioning that says, oh, this is my problem, resistance is here, anger is here, sadness is here, this is a problem to me, this means X, Y, Z about me, and I need to get rid of it, I need to find out how to get rid of it. And then we either go, m most commonly we go to some sort of external source, or some sort of external journey to try to figure that out or get rid of this thing that we're believing is our problem. This thing we're believing is why we're suffering, um, whether it be an addiction, a resistance, um, a thought, <laughs> an old memory, uh, anything. I mean, there's like many, many number of things that become in, in the human consciousness become deemed as get rid of, like wrong, like so wrong. Like it's, you shouldn't have that thought. You shouldn't think that way. You shouldn't feel that way. You shouldn't be that way. You shouldn't move that way. There's so much shouldn't um, feel, uh, ingrained in the human psyche and, and again into our behaviors, into our behavioral language, into our uh, verbal language, into our thought processes, into the way we experience life moment to moment really. And um, It's ca that that ingrained process and conditioning is what makes it feel counterintuitive what I'm saying when I'm saying go towards that which is here like if frustration is here then it's it's sort of it to me it feels like the approach of true nature is to like go ooh frustration what's that let me see what that is let me see what happens when I allow myself freedom, because true nature is free, you are free. When I allow that freedom, 
to be with what is without needing to fade it or fix it or change it in any way, but being open and curious. What is this? What, what happens when I feel frustration? Like, how does my body respond? How does my body want to move? What happens in my mind? Like, what thoughts come up? What memories come up, you know, and it could be frustration or um, any, any number of things. There's so many things like um, an emotion, uh, an experience, a thought. You, you get where I'm going with this, but like anything that, that comes up that we're like, oh, hold on, that's our problem. We need to get rid of that. We need to figure out a way to fix that. What if that's not true? Like, what if, what if, um, you know, I don't, I don't want you to believe me. And that's why I say what if, because it's like, it's more like a science. It's more like hypothesis, experiential science, I guess, if you will, that says, well, what is this? Like, what, what does it feel like? What happens? What happens when I believe that I'm shit? What happens when I believe that I can't handle this experience? What happens when I believe that thought? So I'm not saying to try to get rid of it. I'm saying to believe it so fully that you are it. And then you begin to see and feel and experience it as what you are because it is and how it moves. And then the magic in that is it resolves itself. It res everything has this magical ability to resolve if there's disharmony or discord. It has an ability to resolve when it is fully allowed to be what it is. And that seems counterintuitive because we don't want to feel bad. We don't want to feel uncomfortable. But I'm saying, how about we feel, if, if the feeling of uncomfortable is here, how about we feel it more fully, actually? How about we experience it more fully and we give it permission to be what it is? And often I find in this orientation to inquiry, this orientation to awakening, orientation to freedom to direct experience ultimately it's sort of like in right like through it it's like the only way out is in right it's so true but if you're moving towards something with the need for it to be changed or healed or different than it is then you need to uh I don't want to say that you need to, but the skillful approach would be to, to move back and work with the layer that's there first. So for instance, if it's like, okay, I'm feeling this pain in my belly and I want it to go away. So Violet's saying, if I give it attention, if I let it dance, if I give it the food it wants, if I just explore it, then it will go away. Then it will resolve itself. So let me try to do that, right? Like we're unconsciously doing this. I'm characterizing it in a sense to give, give that part a voice because it's such an unconscious tendency that we often don't see, right? So... It's sort of like, or it is like, true nature moves towards without the model of right or wrong at all. Like true nature doesn't understand right or wrong. True nature um, understands harmony or disharmony, I guess you could say, or balance or out of balance. But even giving it those designations is too much dualism for what it really is. But it's as close as I can get with language because right or wrong has like such a different vibe to it so I'm experiencing this sensation in my belly that I don't like or I'm having this thought that I don't like um, or I'm suffering and I don't like it and I'm gonna try to like do something to make it go away or make myself feel better instead of make trying to make yourself feel better or instead of trying to make this go away I'm saying what would it be like if I it, it, like flipped it entirely. It's like um, feeling this feeling of inside out, like entirely inside out. Like what would it feel like if I allowed myself the permission to not like this experience and period. 
right? Like nothing more, like not, I don't like it and I'm gonna try to fix it because most of our lives, we're spending our time out here in the landscape, in the forest and in, in the, the horizontal plane of time um, in the relative life, trying to figure out what next thing I need to do to help get rid of this thing that I don't like or help fix me on some level that I am, am interpreting that I'm broken in or I'm unhealed in. Um, so we're spending our lives out, out here in this landscape and I'm saying, why don't we just like, Ugh, I just don't fucking like that I'm in pain. I just hate it that I'm in pain actually, right? Like fully like find a way to like not like it so hard, like so full. Like I just don't like it. Like fully, what would it be like to fully not like something and not like, like it's like sort of like underneath it all we're not liking it but we're not fully acknowledging that we don't like it because we believe we should be liking it or we believe that we shouldn't be trying to heal it or the other example is like i really want this to heal here's an example that was really useful for me in my path or just how it unfolded was i have had chronic illness for many many years and it is a very challenging body to live in a chronic illness body but i will tell you an identified body uh, <laughs> having the structure of identity and having chronic illness is a wildfire. It sucks so bad. But this body still has chronic illness and there's no pushing or pulling against it anymore because the limiting factor, the actual suffering factor was the identity that isn't there anymore. So the body still feels illness. The body still has challenges with chronic illness for sure. And it's also a lot less because of the identity isn't there. But I don't, it, it's not um, illnesses that are, um, that can entirely heal in a way, right? But the experience of the illness is, in t is night and day difference. But how did I get there is the question, right? Like how did I get to like equanimity with being in pain and equanimity with having gut issues and equanimity with having these, these challenges with with all of the functions of my body through this illness. How did I get there to have equanimity with that? Well, it was many, many times of hating it, of absolutely hating that my body was sick and that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. But there was many times of like hating that but trying to not hate it because I believe that I shouldn't be hating it or that I believe that I was helpless to it or couldn't do anything about it. And there's many loops in what I'm saying, and I'm kind of vaguely touching on the different things here. But when I was like, I don't, I don't even know how it happened, but somehow I realized, oh my God, I'm approaching this with a need for it to change. I'm trying to change reality and trying to put personal will onto reality is just like, it's like the dumbest thing in a way. Like it just doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. Not one bit. It really creates a lot of suffering, right? Because it, it, personal will is like such a, like if I were to compare it, like say, this is personal will, this small little energy ball as personal will. And then reality is everything else. So this trying to push against reality creates chronic illness, creates suffering, right? It, it creates this like very, unappetizing experience of being in life, being human, being in a body, being in a mind. Like it just is a terrible experience as most of you know, if you've suffered for any, even for a moment and most humans suffer for more than a moment for sure. Suffering fucking sucks. But again, when we're trying to fix suffering through believing it shouldn't be there or believing that it's the culprit, it's the it's the thing that's making everything bad in a way that's true, right? In a way, it's true. The suffering is what makes the experience very uncomfortable and very bad. It's, it's very true, right? And yet, if you approach it with the right or wrong model, then you're, you're never going to solve it in a sense. Like, it's never going to resolve. It's only when things are allowed to be what they are do they resolve? 
So I had to some, you know, I don't know if you've heard, ever heard uh, Angelo say, sometimes you need to suffer more. And that's very true because um, there were parts of my, my own experience with chronic illness that I definitely needed to suffer more, which is a hard pill to swallow. And I don't know that I realized it at the time. It was just what was happening. But in retrospect, I can see that like, until I had exhausted that personal will pushing against reality, which reality was showing up as illness, right? Reality was manifesting how it was manifesting and I was trying to push it away, try to heal it, try to find the next modality that will make me feel better. I was trying to have a different experience than the one I was having. But uh, I guess two, two components here that personal will does not actually exhaust itself until the self structure is entirely crumbled, entirely seen through. So it's it's been this process of awakening, and this is why I believe in awakening, and I believe in in looking at the nature of identity, and the importance on this path of really looking at the identifying factors in in one's direct experience or the beliefs, the very limiting, like beliefs are limiting, identity is limiting. It, it, it's limiting to be able to, it lim, um, it's a limiting factor that um, doesn't allow clear seeing, doesn't allow uh, the moment to be experienced directly. And for it to be experienced directly is to be experienced accurately. And for it to be experienced accurately is freedom even if there's still illness or anything else. Like the reality can manifest as anything really, but it's, um, don't believe now from what I just said that, oh, that means I need to get rid of identity. It doesn't mean you need to get rid of identity, but it is helpful to know that, oh, this component of my experience, my beliefs, my identities, is what limits me from experience reality directly and having the freedom that I deserve, the freedom that is your true nature, right? So yes, I'm saying that identity is the culprit, but I'm not saying it's a problem. And that's the that's a key difference because if we start attacking it like it's the problem, like we've done with anger historically, like we've done with shame historically, like we've done with so many parts of the human experience that is just um, hidden away in this like under the bed, uh, monstrous place that there's just monsters live under the bed. Like we've done that historically through our human con um, experience. That's just how the conditioning has manifest. We've made things demonized. We've made things wrong. You know, it shows up in, in every way of like our religion and our communication. And like there's certain things that are acceptable to share with, with somebody and there's certain things that are not. So you have to hide your shame and apologize for being direct. Or, you know, again, I'm, t I'm kind of like, I feel like I'm petting a lot of different things. I'm touching on a lot of different things in the point of what I'm saying. But if we make... If we can acknowledge, it's important to acknowledge that like this identity aspect of my experience is what creates suffering. It's true. <laughs> it is absolutely true. And yet, if we approach it like it's something that we need to get rid of, then um, we're missing the mark for sure. So it's more so... coming into your moment to moment experience, acknowledging what identity even is, what it feels like, what the experience of it is, what thoughts arise that are identity thoughts. It's about clear seeing, if anything. If I were to say it's all about anything, it's about clear seeing. To see what does it feel like when I identify? What does it feel like when I identify with the, as a mom? What does it feel like when I identify as a girlfriend? What does it feel like as an I, when I identify as a someone? What does it feel like when I identify as a non-someone, right? Which is the same thing. All are the same. All identity is created equal, treated equal in a way. 
it all comes from the same space, the same thing. Um, so what does it feel like when I allow myself to hate my mom, which is something I had to do on my path? What does it feel like when I allow myself to have compassion and love her, which I had to do on my path too, right? Um, it's really giving yourself permission to experience everything so fully that you are it. There's no separation anymore. There's just that experience. When I allowed myself to hate my mom, there was all there was was hatred. When I allowed myself to blame her, all there was was blame. And there's something so healing about that and freeing about that. Not this like peripherally like, yeah, um, I know I hate her and yeah, that's her fault. And like, you know, this kind of like peripheral of it. It's like, no, like actually die into the expression of rage and hatred and let it be directed. Let its world be so clearly seen through your eyes that that's what you are. Because that's how it frees. That's, that's how it's allowed freedom. But it's when we spiritualize it, which I did for years, and it was a part of my journey, spiritualized it like, um, I don't need to allow myself to, uh, or I don't hate my mom anymore. I hated her my whole life, by the way, but never really fully let myself feel that. But through my the beginning of my awakening journey, I was like, oh, I, I could see. And it was true. It was so, it was a depth of love that I never experienced as well. It was not to make it that it happened wrong by any means, but it's the opposite side. It was in the beginning when I had my first awakening and I can see that she wasn't anyone different than me. She wasn't anything different than me, that she is what I am. And I could fully acknowledge that in my consciousness, in my heart. Um, I could forgive her, like undeniably forgive her. That was so beautiful and needed. Um, and then <laughs> then many years later, I realized that there was still hatred in me towards her and that something something wasn't complete in that uh, evolution, right? The evolution was to love her, but also to hate her. And when I allow myself to have both, to fully experience both, allow both of those to fully be in the consciousness here, be in my heart here, be an expression here, then there was freedom. Then there was, I don't need to love her or hate her. And then what happens is if I love her, it happens in the moment. If I hate her, it happens in the moment. Anything in between, right? Like it, it, it opens the freedom for anything to be expressed, like any, anything. There's no like ideas anymore of like, oh, if I hate her, that means I'm a bad person. Or if I hate her, here's one. If I hate her, it means that I haven't really, I haven't really awakened to true nature yet because I'm still experiencing her as separate. To hate somebody else doesn't have to be a separate experience. I know a huge paradox there, but it's true. But hatred is very sacred and hatred deserves to be embodied. Yeah, that's, I found the most freedom in embodiment, like bringing the insight sides, like releasing identity and awakening my heart and my mind and my gut to the insight path. Um, to realize the truth of reality and then to and embody it, right? The truth of, of reality is inclusive. It includes everything. Everything is a part of that. There's nothing that needs to be thrown away or done away with. There's no part of you that needs to be healed. There's no part of you that isn't, isn't allowed here. And then the, the, the thing that I, I feel so grateful for, my goodness, the ability, because of that, the ability to go anywhere, into anything, at any time, with anyone. There's no place I won't go. And that, that's not violet. That's true nature. But the, the identity, the limiting selfing identity and selfing will limits that true nature to move as it does and when that's not there there's just this movement there's just this freedom of there's no place i won't go so show me where you're hurting and let me hold you like that's really what it says it just turns towards turns towards turns towards so 
So follow the threads of this moment, follow the threads of what's happening. Write down, journal the beliefs that say, that you find on your path that say, oh, I shouldn't be having this experience because of this reason, right? Or this experience means I'm not spiritual. Or this experience is what means I'm not awake. This sensation is what means that I am contracted and that means that I am not free explore it maybe it does mean that but maybe it doesn't right and explore it and there isn't a right or wrong this is like my favorite thing to share is that there's not a wrong experience there is literally only what's happening which means that the experience you're having right now is the right one and when we can inhabit that and move through that and live within that knowing of that the embodiment of that then there's freedom there's no worry of like judgment, like, oh my gosh, how will you judge me? I'm well aware that the mind is a judge has a judgmental meter in it, right? It's, it's ingrained into it through safety and through conditioning, right? Judging like, oh, Violet's right or wrong right now. Violet doesn't know what she's talking about or, oh, Violet does know what she's talking about. They're equal, right? You, for, for you to have the thought, watching this video thinking Violet has no idea what she's talking about or the thought Violet does know what she's talking about or I really like what Violet's talking about or I really don't like what she's talking about or I'm so confused or I totally get it anything that's in the polarity they're both equal both sides of a polarity is the same it arises from the same space which is the dualistic nature of thought it's not what you are and it's not what this is which is good news but that doesn't mean that you need to try to stop identifying with it. It more so means to recognize, to see clearly, to recognize what's happening. What does it feel like when you judge this video or what I'm saying for this moment, or you judge yourself in this moment? What does that feel like? How does that move through your body? What does it trigger in your thoughts, right? So, Again, I can really, <laughs> I could talk about this forever because it's so beautiful and I just feel like it has such an aliveness, but it's the counter intuitive approach that is actually the most immediate direct approach of true nature, but it's counterintuitive to our processing systems of thought and identity that we've learned and that are super ingrained and intertwined into again, all human communication, behavior, internal thoughts, internal world, uh, verbal behavior, physical behavior, all of it. So that was fun. I love you. I hope you enjoyed this. And if you didn't enjoy this, then I hope you fully didn't enjoy it. <laughs> and um, hmm. If you stuck along, if you stuck into this, if you stuck into this video, which is not, that's kind of weird. If you stuck along this long, it still doesn't make sense. Oh my goodness. <laughs> if you've watched, if you've been with me in this video this long, and this is relevant in time because it's kind of weird with YouTube videos. I know you could be like seeing this three years later or in some other dimension or something, who knows. But if you're in the dimension of this one, <laughs> whichever this one is, then or whenever it doesn't even matter but I just wanted to invite you we do have small group inquiries where we explore all of these type of things directly and they're private groups and um, we're in August 2024 when I'm making this video so we have one I think uh, I think it's next Friday I want to say not tomorrow tomorrow's Friday but next Friday um, the 23rd I believe let me look at the calendar really quick so I can get it right um, yeah, 23rd next Friday. Um, so please join us if that is something that you would like to explore and dive in to whatever's happening in your direct experience. Um, we also have a, um, or, or typically two a month. So one in the morning for like European people, that's usually around an 11 a.m. Uh, mountain time. Or uh, so you, usually there's two group inquiries a month. One is in the morning and one is in uh, a Friday in the afternoon. So yeah, and then every other month there's a full day immersive retreat 
um, which we explore so many things. We dance together, we do inquire together, we have Angelo doing Q&A and talks, we do breath work together, it's a really fun day together. Um, join us for that. We have one on the 24th of this month, and the next one after that will be October. And um, what else? I love to just support you how, however I can in all the ways that is available. Um, what are the other things? Oh, we have like satsang group meetings, so that's like membership based and you can join the community and we have one or two meetings a month where I do a guided meditation, a talk or Q and, and then we do some Q&A and I just interact with you. Um, many things to join if you're looking for support. I hope you, you find it. If you resonate with, with me and the teaching here, then you're welcome to join us. I'd love to meet you or see you. Um, and yeah, I just want to say also just like, uh, just so arising in my heart, like there are some of you that I know probably watch my videos still that I haven't seen in a really long time. And maybe we worked one-on-one -on -one or you've come to groups. And I just want to say I'm very grateful for you and you being part of this journey. And I, I have this experience where like sometimes I'll, you know, I've been teaching for a few years and, and I'll have this experience of working with somebody um, for a length of time and then um, not seeing them for a length of time. And that's just kind of the nature of how it goes and, and, and um, how it unfolds for people and what they need. But I have this experience every once in a while of remembering somebody, even if I saw them once, I, like I just feel like I could feel them. Like it's like this visceral feeling and memory and I feel such joy and I kind of like wonder where you are in the world or what's happening for you and those kind of things and I just feel it just feels really sweet so I just wanted to say that I'm very grateful for um, being in these spaces of truth with you guys and whichever way that we are and I love you so much and hopefully I'll see you soon bye